Welcome to another episode of the Private Practice with Self podcast. I'm your host, Brooklyn, and I'm so pleased that you're here. And guess what? If you can hear a little bit of background noise, which I hope you can't because I do have my Apple AirPods on, but if you can, it's just because I'm talking to you while I'm driving, which is totally safe because I'm hands-free, so please don't worry about that or um, anything. It's just like you're in the car with me and we're just having a conversation. So I am on my way to return a Christmas present I got my mum because she didn't like it, which is totally fine. Um, and I'm going to swap it for something else. So the journey takes about 20 minutes, I think, maybe half an hour. We'll see how we go. And I thought I would use this time to connect with you because I haven't spoken to you. It feels like a little while. It might be about a week. So anyway, look, it's the end of the year and I don't want to be that podcast that does the whole, you know, reflection thing and the planning thing. I'm just not in the mood for that this year and I'm sure you're probably all planned out and stuff as well. But what I thought I would do is give you some tips if you want them. Uh, if you don't want them, that's okay. <laughs> I'm just going to share them anyway. But maybe give you some tips on how you can create success in a way that you define success for you and your private practice for the coming 12 months. And I just want to share with you the things that I've learned in nearly 30 years of private practice that really helped me and became, I'm going to use that word I don't like, game changer, <laughs> um, it became a game changer for me. So the first thing is that um, when it came to creating success, for the longest time, I was just winging that in private practice. And I know now that that was a big mistake because it did end up costing me not only money and energy and time, but nearly cost me my sanity. I mean, I was so down on myself and so frustrated and so, you know, so many sleepless nights and things like that. And I would often feel like, oh, I'm doing all of this work and it's not paying off. And then, you know, my husband at the time, one of my husbands, I'm like Jaja Gabor over here. I've had a few of them, but the husband at the time, <laughs> the husband du jour was, you know, sort of saying, hey, you know, maybe we give this private practice gig a, a break and you go and work for someone. Do you know what I mean? And so I was just dealing with that, which isn't great when you're trying your best to maintain your own confidence and you've got loved ones around you going, yeah, well, maybe just give it another few weeks and then get a real job kind of thing. It's it's not nice. And what I know now is that had I gotten help or allowed myself to be helped, I could have created success a lot more quickly. And for me at that point in my life, so I'm going back, well, let's say 20 years ago, for me, that was very much about the finances because um, my husband at the time, he was very depressed. I was married to somebody who had, um, you know, multiple diagnoses. He had bipolar mood disorder. Um, but there were symptoms and signs of schizoaffective disorder, but not enough to meet the diagnostic criteria, according to the psychiatrist. So that was challenging. Um, plus there was anxiety, plus there was depression, right? You, you get the idea. And this essentially meant that he was in and out of work, like there was no stability there um, and just moody. And at that time too, I went through a very bad experience myself. I was doing some contract work with a big organisation. I won't say the name because you will recognise and know who they are, but um, I was doing some contract work for them. And what ended up happening was for the very first time, this is the only time I've ever, ever, ever had this happen to me, but I was working and I got to work I opened up the office and I saw a client sitting there in the hall. You know, she was just sitting outside. The The building wasn't open yet. So I was the first one there. I saw her there straight away so, and told me she was my client. I asked her her name. She, she told me, I said, yep, you're my client. Do you want to just give me a minute? I'll go and open up the office. I went and opened up and I was so, so naive and I was so, so trusting. Like, because... 
I never had any negative experiences. So I just went and opened up the lights and I turned on and I opened up the blinds and turned on, you know, the coffee machine and I did all of that. And then I said to her, well, you know what, you're here now. So let's not wait until 8.30 for your appointment. Like you're already here. It's 10 past eight. I'll just see you now. And that way you can leave early. And she said, okay, that'd be great. And then I took her into the office and it was a corner office. You know, such a cliche, isn't it? But it was a corner office and it had glass overlooking the beach and um, you think it's going to be a beautiful spot to work but you actually don't face the window in this office you're facing into the office your back's against the the window and against the corner but anyway um, there's glass walls and there were the interior walls were glass as well they've been frosted you know for privacy and everything but anyway so I take her in and as we're doing uh, her session people are arriving to to work and it's all great and then um what happens is middle of the session she has a psychotic episode and attacks me and well i don't know if you say attack or if you say assault but it was pretty scary at the time she flew across the desk at me um she was just away with the pixies she flew across the desk at me with such force that I was on one of those desk chairs that you see typically at an office on the little caster wheels and everything. Um, I went cas- careening, cascading, I don't know. I, she pushed me and I went right back on my chair into the glass wall and I was so worried that I was going to drop three or four stories into the asphalt below. It was so scary. Um, and, yeah, and then I was down on my back and she was on top of me and she was hair pulling and scratching me and, you know, choking me and all of this sort of stuff. And I didn't know what on earth was going on. And lucky for me, like, I couldn't get to my duress alarm. It, it was under the desk, but um, I wasn't anywhere near under the desk. I was up against the the wall on the floor, laying on my back on the floor up against the wall. But anyway, one of the guys that worked there had just arrived and he'd heard that there was commotion and he opened up the door to see if everything was all right so what was happening called one or two of the other guys they all pulled her off we da 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 we got the um ambulance and the police um and then yeah it turns out that this lady was released from jail the night before and I don't know, she did well to get to the appointment considering she didn't really have transport or anything. I don't know how she got there. But yeah, she was, I don't know, there was something wrong. I don't know if she was off her medication or if maybe she'd taken something. Um, but yeah, she had a psychotic break. Of course, I didn't press any charges or anything like that because it's mental health. What are you going to do? But would you believe, and I know I'm digressing a little bit, but I just want to share this with you. Would you believe the other thing that happened was um, the very next day, the very next day, uh, well, hang on, that day, I'm just all in a daze, right? And everything's kind of happening in a whirlwind, but my clients are piling up in reception. There's nobody there to see them except for me because the company that I was working for were renting a room at this business. And... Um, Anyway, nobody had gone and told my clients, look, she's not going to be able to see people today. And clients were starting to get aggressive out in reception. So I was like, do you know what? It's just fine. I mean, I was in total shock. I can see that now. I didn't see it at the time. I was in shock. I shouldn't have kept working, but I did. And I saw the rest of my clients for that day. And to be honest with you, there would have been about eight of them. So um, I saw my clients. Toward the end of the day, I called my husband um and told him what had happened and you know i guess the the anxiety and all that hadn't had a chance to kick in because i'd just gone from being assaulted to dealing with the police like a psychops dealing with the police to dealing with the ambos and then what was happening was i was um dealing with clients so i just went straight back into work mode call him tell him what's happened And as I'm telling him what's happened, I'm starting to get upset and I'm starting to get shaky and I'm starting to get nervous and I'm starting to get like fearful and and jittery and stuff like that. And do you know what he says? He says to me, this is no word of a lie. He says to me, okay, I'm really sorry that that all happened. On the way home, can you please pick up McDonald's? That's what he said to me. But again, 
I couldn't be upset about it or angry about it because he had mental illness. So I was just like, okay, darling, no problem. What would you like? And so I picked up, I picked up the McDonald's and then I rang him and I said, yeah, I've got the Maccas, I'm coming home. And then he said, oh, um, can you also go to the video store? So we used to have Blockbuster near us. Oh, this is the day, right? We have Blockbuster. <laughs> and I went to Blockbuster and I picked him up a movie called Final Destination. I can still remember it in my head. I picked up Final Destination and I took it home and he watched that and ate his McDonald's and he was fine. Um, my boss didn't even call me nothing. Like my boss, I called my boss. He was in a meeting and I left a message to tell him what had happened, but he didn't even call me back for the whole day. And then again, I, I know now, but didn't realize then that I was in so much shock, but I didn't even think. It never occurred to me to cancel the next day's appointments. And so... I went to work to that same location the next day and guess what? There was somebody sitting out in the hall before anybody else was there and I was the first one to get there and I thought, no, I'm not going to let this person in. I'm just going to wait until everybody comes. So I just said, hi, you know, um, we open at 8.30. We'll be with you shortly. There's a coffee shop down the road if you want to go and get a coffee. You know, I did all of that. And then anyway, I waited until people started arriving and then turned out this was my client and I took the client in and I was doing his assessment and would you believe that this client, um, upon hearing that he was, so I was doing like a job capacity assessment, which was to see whether or not somebody qualified to get a payment from the government at the time, right? I don't know if they're still called that now, but anyway, this is what I was doing and yet so he asked me at the end like is he going to get his payment or something or what what am I putting in the report da, da, da. and so I'm just totally transparent with him and I said well we need some more evidence from your doctor about this that and the other um before we can finalize the report but I haven't got finalized today you know etc etc he lost his marbles and um yeah he pulled out it was a hypodermic pulls out a hypodermic because that was back in the day when that was a thing. Well, in my area where I was living and mostly working at the time, it was a very low socioeconomic area. And we had big issues in um, my area with people with hypodermics and leaving them around, leaving them um, in streets, leaving them in shopping centres, leaving them in bathrooms and toilets, leaving them in um, uh, at the beach, you know, just like littering with them and everything. It was a real big thing. So there was a lot of education that was going on in our community at the time about you know steer clear of hypodermics but he had a hypodermic and yeah told me that he had hep and he was yeah ready to get me with it so he was another one that lunged across the table with his big needle well to me it seemed very big at the time it was all I could focus on I couldn't describe his face but I could tell you what the needle looked like um and yeah again I'm unable to get to the duress alarm and again, it was just because the guys at the desks on the other side of my partition could hear that there was scuffling, they came in. And so anyway, isn't that so, yeah, so that's kind of what happened. And um, I don't know, like I started this story going somewhere, but you know me, I often go off on tangents. This was about, I was talking about being married, I think, wasn't I? I can't remember. But anyway, those things happen. Oh, this is what I learned, right, about being in private practice. So when you're in private practice, you don't only see clients at your location. You might also be going off-site like I was. So you might be going off-site to perhaps do critical incident stress or EAP. But for me, it was, um, you know, those things. Plus also from time to time I was doing these job capacity assessments and um, doing stuff for Social Security's Appeals Tribunal and, and stuff like that. And it was most of the time the work was fine, but it was the only time I'd ever been attacked or assaulted. I didn't see it coming and I had two events in 24 hours and no support. I didn't have um, my clinical supervisor was on leave. Um, I didn't have a backup. I... 
you know, was working in isolation because I'm off site by myself at some strange other business that I don't know anybody really who works there. My The business I work for is just renting an office. My manager is not returning any of my calls. Anyway, the next day I had to go into the city to like head office. So I went there and I told them what had happened and they said, well, you still right to see people today. So this was how poorly managed it was. But again, at the time I didn't realise, I just kept doing my job. Um, and this is what I want to, this is why I'm sharing it with you because it's so, so, so important. But anyway, so I, I just kept doing my job. And then I went back to HR and I said, listen, I think maybe I want to speak to somebody. Um, do we have EAP? And they said, oh, we'll have to see whether or not we can get it approved. And guess what? They sent an email to everybody in the organization about me getting EAP and asking for EAP about how um, because, I was a, because I was a psychologist, I shouldn't need EAP and that I could just debrief with another psychologist and that this was just um, a general notice to all psychologists who were working for this business. Um, that if you wanted EAP to just debrief with each other and my name was on it and I was so embarrassed I was mortified and there wasn't anything I could do because now everybody knew something had happened and I wanted to get counselling and 20 years ago there was still stigma um, and especially amongst in psychology then um, that there was stigma amongst like colleagues like I didn't want my colleagues who I was in charge of I was their boss I didn't want them knowing that I needed help. And anyway, so it was a real, real mess. What I didn't realize then that I know now is that this event or series of events significantly impacted on my ability to create a private practice that was successful to me, which was about the finances and it was about being fulfilling. I wasn't feeling fulfilled I was killing myself, burning the candle at both ends, trying to see as many, many people as I could for a really bad hourly rate. And with these type of assessments, you couldn't convert these into private fee-paying clients like you can with EAP. I was just getting this bad rate. And I allowed it to happen because I didn't know any different. And I wasn't in a supportive community. You know, I, I didn't come onto Facebook until what, 2016, I think it was, or 2017. So I didn't even know that Facebook groups existed for, for community and, and support and stuff like that. Anyway, this ended up having long-term consequences that I didn't realise until I was much older. But what had happened was I had taken all of these events and in my mind thought to myself, okay, so I'm not worth looking after. I'm not worth a, a decent fee. And this is as good as it's ever going to get for me. So why should I keep trying to create success? If I want more money, I'm just going to have to keep doing this job that I don't like, um, that's scary now, that's dangerous now, and I'm going to have to see as many clients as I can so that I can afford to support my husband, pay the mortgage, do the bills. Da, 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 da. That was how I started seeing things. And it didn't lead to burnout because I had work conditioned myself to be able to sustain seeing this number of clients at this level. And what I know now is that none of that that I did was necessary. It was not necessary. What I could have done was I could have absolutely gone out and had my own private practice seeing private clients um, more safely and for a better fee and see clients that I like to work with, like not doing jackers, not doing job capacity assessments, but doing things that I really like, like doing the more spiritual type counselling, doing the more inside out work, you know. But for the longest time, I didn't realise that. Um, I didn't realise the, the extent of the damage that had been done to my confidence, to my worth and to my self-esteem as a result of, not having support, not having support from friends and family, 
also, I didn't give many friends the opportunity to support me because I was ashamed. I was really ashamed. And when I did say to a couple of people, you know, I think maybe I've got a little bit of PTSD or I think maybe I've got a little bit of anxiety, people would say, how can you? You're a psychologist. And then I would close up again. And then I wouldn't tell anybody about it again. And so there was all of this stuff happening and it affected me for the longest, longest time. It affected me because I didn't see the worth in the work that I was doing. I didn't see the worth in the fee. I didn't see the worth in myself. So for the longest time, I stayed working with this difficult demographic of client because I didn't think I was good enough to do anything else. And I undercharged for my services for the longest time because I didn't think I was good enough. I was My worth was dependent on what other people thought of me back then. And I thought, if other people valued me, if, you know, I'm not even worth EAP, for goodness sake. I'm not even worth privacy and confidentiality, for goodness sake. I'm not even worth more than this session fee per hour, for goodness sake. Like, it really affected me for many, many years. And as you know, I'm working with a money coach at the moment, so all this stuff is coming up. And it's so interesting to be able to reflect on that. So I'm sharing this with you, not because I want empathy or sympathy or nice emails and messages. It's not for that. What I want you to take away from this is please make sure moving into the next year that you're surrounded by multiple avenues of support. I want you to in your podcast journal, you know, maybe hit pause on this episode in a moment. But I do want you to, um, you know, get out a piece of paper or get out your journal in on a fresh piece of paper in the middle of that piece of paper, write the word me. Just write the word me and put a circle around it. And then I want you to put other circles, smaller ones around that. And in each one of those, I want you to put the names of people who can support you. So put the name of your supervisor, put the name of your private practice coach if you've got one, um, put the name of your bestie, put the name of a colleague or a peer that you respect or look up to or trust, put the name of your doctor, put the name of, you know, somebody that you would see if you ever needed counselling for something, you know, somebody that you would trust. If you don't know who you would see, start keeping an eye out in the groups for people and um, make notes of anybody that is writing comments that, you know, really resonate with you or that make you feel a sense of respect for them or, or admiration or like they know that what they're talking about, they know their stuff. But please keep this somewhere because you just never know what's around the corner. I never, ever, 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 ever want anything to happen to any of you, especially to the extent that it happened to me. But working in mental health, most of us, not all counsellors work in mental health, by the way, um, but most of us that are working in mental health may have an experience or more from time to time where we're dealing with traumatic events that happen in our practice. They, these traumatic events might happen with the clients, Uh, They're not limited to that, are they? These traumatic events can also happen with parents of clients. So those of you who are working with children um, may have already been exposed to, you know, perhaps parents that were difficult to deal with or problematic or didn't respect the boundaries and just went too far. By going too far, it upset you, it triggered something in you, it it perhaps traumatised you, perhaps made you feel unsafe, you know. That's why I really want you to understand that now um, in 2023 slash 2024, it's more than okay for you to go and get help and it's the right thing to do. And if you need it, please access it. But in the moment, you might not even think about that because the shock sets in and you just don't think. And unless you're connected to somebody who knows you that can say, hey, you know, what's up? You're not yourself at the moment. You're a little bit more snappy than usual. How come you're suddenly coming in late? Um, Hey, you're a little bit more irritable. Hey, are you sleeping okay? Hey, I noticed you didn't eat your your dinner tonight. You need somebody around you that's going to be able to see signs in you because you won't be able to see them for yourself, you know. 
And so that's what I want you to take away. Number one is moving into the new year with your private practice. Please make sure that you've got support because it's this support that becomes a foundation for you to create success for your private practice. Um, the other thing that I learned in my 30 years was that you can change your business same and you can change your branding as many times as you like. You are not locked into anything. And that's something that's really important to know. So, for example, um, you know, I just recently rebranded a couple of months ago when I redid my website, a whole new rebranding. Um, it's all now lovely shades of pink and florals. I mean, it was dark, moody florals before, but now we've got light, bright florals. We've got baby's breath. We've got pink roses, apricot roses, all that kind of stuff. Um, I've just gone and, um, well, I'm in the middle of doing upgrades for all of my memberships it's going to take a couple of months but they're all in process and they're all getting a rebrand um but my business it's had multiple different names it's had um, multiple different colors it's had multiple different logos and i want you to understand that um if you are in the mood to give your branding a facelift go for it like do it just enjoy it nobody's going to care you're not going to lose clients because you changed your branding I think what happens is, you know, sometimes people say, oh, but your branding needs to stay the same in order to build a reputation. I think that doesn't apply in our industry. I think what um, what people are doing when they say that is they're, they're saying, well, you need brand recognition in order to get customers or clients. And that might be true for other industries. Like if you think about Nike, I don't think that they've ever changed their logo of that swoosh, you know. Adidas, I don't think they've changed their logo of the three stripes or whatever it is. McDonald's, it's the same logo pretty much. I think they went through a couple of um, changes when they were first starting out, but now it's pretty much a golden arches. Um, so it's a thing in those other industries, like maybe in retail and hospitality, you need to have consistency with the logo. I believe in our industry, whether you're a psychologist, a social worker, counsellor, or whether you're in other alternative or natural or complementary therapies, um, I think what builds our client base is our reputation for the work that we do. And I think people aren't going to give a hoot what colour your, your brand is this week. They know you. They trust you. They like the way you work, um, the outcomes you get, the results you get, the resources you share. It's about you um, and it's about how you show up. It's about your energy. It's about your vibe. I think in our industry, the colours and the logo don't really matter that much. The reason that I want to share this with you is because some private practice owners that I've worked with have still got the same branding that they've had but it's not feeling congruent with them anymore and they've evolved like they were doing one thing when they started but now they've gone down all this extra PD and they've got they've started working with a different client base but their branding isn't matching now what they're doing but they don't want to let it go because they've been told that they've got to keep everything the same I'm here today to say to you as living proof no if you need to change it so it better matches what you're doing now and who you are now, go for it. Just change it. You absolutely can. It's totally fine for you to do that. Okay? So evolution is part of the business. And to be honest with you, how lucky are your clients to see that, wow, your practice is evolving because you've got these new skills now. Wow, that, that's so amazing. Can you help me? Can you help my brother? Can you help my friend? This is a good thing. Clients like it when we upgrade. It's kind of like, um, I don't know, if you think about styles and fashion or interior design or something like that you know we don't want to be too dated <laughs> we we always want to keep fresh with our business and fresh with the way that we work our clients want to see that we are up to date with the latest therapeutic modalities with the latest um uh you know evidence-based interventions with the with the latest education and knowledge they they want to see that you're keeping up to date with everything so please don't ever feel locked into your branding it's totally fine for you to change it 
the other thing that I wanted to um, share with you is do get regular supervision. I'm addicted to supervision. My poor supervisor, she's just amazing. I've got the best supervisor in the whole wide world. Insane that I haven't seen her for, I think, about six weeks. But I am due and I will book a couple of sessions with her for early in the new year to catch up. But a good supervisor is worth their weight in gold. Now, I've had supervisors before in 30 years. I've had many supervisors and I like to stay with the one supervisor for as long as I can because... It's just to me so much easier. I can dip in, I can dip out, and I don't need to restart my story. They already know me. Um, they already know my strengths. They already know areas I need to work on. They already know, yeah, what I'm what I'm like, and they they can be a really really great barometer for, you know, how I'm going in my business, and they can be a really great sounding board because they know how I work and they know my style, and it's just great. I love it so much. Um, however, it did take me time to find a supervisor that I clicked with. In fact, I was just sort of hopping along from supervisor to supervisor for a little while and um, I don't ever think I took it too seriously. I saw it when I was first starting in private practice. I saw it as an expense. I didn't see it as an investment. I saw it as, oh, now I've got, I've got to pay for this every month. Um, well, for me, it was like three or four sessions a month because of the volume of clients that I was seeing. So when you're a psychologist, you and also for counselling, um, there's a minimum number of sessions you need to have. And I think for me back then it was 10. I think even with ACA now, it's a minimum of 10. And with PACFA, it's a minimum of 10 um, over the course of a year. But... Um, the more clients you see, the more supervision you need, right? So, yeah, I just saw it as an expense. I saw it as a, as a waste of time. I was very egotistical about it. I will tell you that, you know, I struggled to find a supervisor that I'd click with because of my own ego. I was going into supervision thinking, this is going to be a waste of time. I've got somebody less qualified than me that's going to like tell me how I should be running my business or how I should be working with clients. And I was resistant. I would book sessions and cancel them. And I was a real pain for so many supervisors because just my ego, I couldn't get out of my own way with it. Um, and it wasn't until probably, I don't know, maybe about 10 years ago now, then I started to take it seriously and started seeing that, okay, there are some benefits. But guess what? This mindset shift didn't happen until my business was in a place where I felt like I could afford to pay for it. Can you believe that? I was in scarcity mindset financially with my business for such a long time that I used to get angry about paying for things. Like, I don't know. I see it now in the counsellors' communities that I lead I, and it frustrates me, but I used to be there. But I, I see so many of them asking for free things or getting upset or angry or bothered by the fact that people were charging for, for things. Even me, if I go and say, hey, I've got this new thing and it's you know $11 or something, I'll always get some someone private messaging me about how horrible I am for charging $11 for something. Um but I was that person too. Um, I need to I need to remind myself of that. I was that person too for the longest time. I used to really, I used to hate spending money because I would think they're taking the money from my business. This is money that I need for business cards. This is money I need for, for GoDaddy. <laughs> this is money I need for whatever, right? I used to really loathe that because I didn't see the value in it at all. It was I saw it as a box ticking exercise. So I would turn up and I'd say what needed to be said and I'd leave. So for the longest time, I just didn't get any value from it because of my own mindset. When the finances changed in my business, um, there was more profit in the business. There was more breathing space. I calmed down and I breathed. And then I was able to go, all right, well, I've got money here now and I'm, I know I need to do supervision. So I'm just going to see if I can find somebody who I really like. I'm not going to shop for the cheapest supervisor, which is what I had been doing, which is why I say to you, 
don't be the cheapest. Um, you don't want to get clients because you're the cheapest because you'll get clients like me who are the wrong type of client. You'll get the t- you'll get the client that cancels and reschedules and doesn't participate and doesn't do the work like me. You don't want me for a client um, back then. Different now. But once that money was there and it was available and I could, as I said, breathe, I was like, oh, okay, great. Well, now I don't have to get the cheapest counsel, cheapest um, supervisor anymore. I can get the supervisor that's the right one for me. And then I started to, like, get excited about almost shopping for a supervisor and going on um, different websites and looking in the groups and reading people's um, threads about the supervision I provide and say, oh, you look interesting. Oh, that's that's great, but that's not. I'm not an EMDR person or, you know, stuff like that and then I started to really enjoy you know I guess not only being able to have freedom of choice you know that was a big part of it I I now get to choose who I want to work with I'm not just choosing the cheapest supervisor I'm I'm getting to choose who I want to work with based on my interests and things started to get really um, a lot more easy and a lot more fun and yeah, I loved it. And then I started showing up for supervision and loved, loved, loved it. Well, I was always showing up, but you know what I mean? Like showing up in the sense of um, being prepared, having questions to take in, having cases to take in that I wanted guidance on, um, you know, issues I wanted um, to, yeah, reflect on, all that kind of stuff became super important and I really valued my supervision then and I booked it out of my diary and I was always saying to my supervisors you know when's the next session let's book the next one in now and I was always leading those conversations about when to have the next session and now like I after all this time I now have settled on like this brilliant supervisor and she's brilliant for me she works with me for me in the sense that we're on the same page it's a vibe um i find it so helpful yeah so if you are starting private practice with my 30 years experience and my own journey what i would love to share with you is please if you can try and see that supervision is a big 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 value add um, it's not a cost. It's if you're just starting and you're bootstrapped and you don't have much money, it's going to hurt, right? You, you're going to feel like this is an expense I can't afford. But I want you to know that if you can just allow yourself the indulgence of shopping for a supervisor, I shouldn't say that phrase. It's not a good phrase, is it? Looking, searching, finding a supervisor that really lights you up Like if you have a look at their profile on Psychology Today or you go into, say, Counselors Connect Australia or the ACPPO Supervisors thread and you just start clicking on some of the links that supervisors have shared and you have a look at the websites and you feel inspired by one, you know, allow yourself, it's not an indulgence, but allow yourself to spend the money because um, it's going to help you so much. You spend so much of your time helping everybody else and giving, 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 giving that it's so nice to have somebody be on your side, number one. Number two, hold space for you so you can be the talker, not the listener. You can be the talker. You can go there and you can um, reflect and you can share things. You can get ideas. And I always come away from my supervision now inspired. But I wish that somebody had shared with me when I was first starting my journey that It's worth the money to get a good supervisor. And a good supervisor doesn't have to be somebody that's with the ACA or with PACFA. You can have those supervisors. That's fine. But you might get a professional supervisor or you might get a supervisor that, um, I don't know, isn't isn't with anybody, but they're perfect for you. Like they've they've done the training. They've got the qualification behind them. They're in the supervisor association. They've, they've ticked all their boxes and everything. But they're perfect for you because the way that they work, who they are, their experience, their vision, um, the way they show up, it all makes sense. And you just really like this person and the way that they work. You are going to get so much value from those sessions. It is going to rapidly help you 
create the the things that you really really want to experience in your private practice i promise you i wish that i had found the supervisor i've got now 20 or 30 years ago i really wish that i found her back then because having her in my world now has created opportunities for me has given me fresh insights fresh awareness help shift things, help me pivot other things, um, help me with accountability. And it's definitely, I, I get my money back because of the way that it works. It just works. So please don't, please don't feel like you've got to get the cheapest supervisor. Allow yourself to spend the money on a supervisor that you resonate with and you connect with because yeah it can totally change your private practice for the better so they're just three things that i wanted to share with you um that i've learned through trial and error over 30 years and yeah i know not everything that i shared with you is pleasant but i wanted to be honest and transparent because I don't think we yet see enough of that in our industry because we um, are still worried about judgment. I don't worry about judgment anymore. I'm very secure in my own skin. I'm very secure in my own business. I trust my intention and that my intentions will always be fulfilled. Like, for example, my intention with this podcast episode was to be open and honest and give you something that was going to be useful and helpful and valuable and hopefully i've been able to achieve that today um and i'm i'm always happy to be raw and real with you because if i'm not going to be who else will be and how are you going to learn and i really want you to be able to look at my journey and look at the journey of others around you and take the shortcut take the shortcut so get the supervisor get some support around you if you need to change your branding for the new year go ahead and change it the other thing that i did today was i did put um, some posts on my instagram about fees and you know what to do to Um, change your fees or set a new fee so if you need some guidance around that go and check the instagram account it's at the private practice coach but otherwise thank you so much for listening today and i guess the next episode will be in the new year have a wonderful wonderful break those of you who are on break those of you who are working through thank you so much for um showing up for our clients who really need you at this difficult time of the year And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye, everyone.